Book 21. The Clash of Man and River. As they came down to a ford in the blue Xanthus, eddying and running, God-begotten, wondrous river, there Achilles drove amid the rout and split them, left and right, scattering half toward Troy over the plain where yesterday Achaeans broke and ran when Hector raged. Now Trojans ran that way, and Hera spread a cloud ahead to slow them. The other half were forced into the stream, now running high with foam on whirlpools. Down they plunged, smacking the water, and the banks and gullied beds echoed their hurly-burly. This way and that they swam, shouting, spun round and round by eddies. As when locusts flitter before a prairie fire into a river, tireless flames leaping abruptly higher scorch them, and they crumple into the water. So the currents rushing before Achilles now grew choked with men and chariot teams. He left his spear propped on a tamarisk by the riverbank. Then, like a wild god, he leapt in savagely for bloody work with sword alone, and struck to right and left, as cries and groans went up from men he slashed, and dark blood flushed the stream. As darting fish in flight before a dolphin crowd the bays of a great roadstead, terrified for he engorges all he catches, so the Trojans cowered down the dangerous river's course and under overhanging banks. Arm-wearied by butchery, Achilles from the stream picked twelve young men alive to pay the price for dead Patroclus. He led these ashore, startled as fawns, and bound their hands behind them, using the well-cut thongs they wore as belts round braided combat shirts. He turned them over to men of his command to be led back to the decked ships, then launched himself again on furious killing. At this point he met a son of Priam, Prince Lycaon, scrambling from the river. Achilles once on a night raid had captured this young man, forced him out of his father's orchard, where with a bronze knife he had been cutting boughs of a wild fig for chariot rails. The raider came like a ghost upon him, unforeseen. That time Achilles sold him overseas to Lemnos. Jason's son had purchased him, but he was freed by an old family friend, Eetion of Imbros, who gave passage to the fair town Arisbe, whence in flight he reached his father's hall. Being come again from Lemnos, he enjoyed eleven days with friends at home. On the twelfth day, a god returned him to the rough hands of Achilles, who would dispatch him to the realm of death. The great battlefield runner, Prince Achilles, found the man disarmed. He had no helm, no shield, not even a spear. All were thrown down when heat and sweat oppressed him as he toiled to leave the stream, his knees sapped by fatigue. Taken aback, grimly Achilles said in his great heart, God, here is a strange thing to have before my eyes. Trojans I've killed will stand up in the western gloom of death if this one could return, his evil day behind him. After I sold him, shipped him out to Lemnos Island. The great grey salt sea that balks the will of many could not stop him. Well, let him taste our spearhead now. Let me absorb the answer. Can it be he'll come back from the grave, or will the fertile earth detain him as it does the strongest dead? Thus he reflected, waiting, and the other came in a rush to clasp his knees, confused, but mad with hope to escape the pain of death and the black shape of destiny. Achilles raised his long spear, aiming to run him through. Lycaon ducked and ran, and took his knees, even as the driven spear passed over, starved for blood and raw man-flesh, and stuck in earth. Grasping one knee, the unarmed man held on with his left hand to the spear shaft of Achilles and pled with him. I come before your knees, Achilles. Show respect and pity me. Pleader and plea are worth respect, your grace. You were the first Achaean at whose hands I tasted the bruised barley of Demeter, upon that day when, among orchard trees, you captured me, then shipped me out to Lemnos, away from father and friends. I earned for you a hundred bulls worth. Triple that I'll bring as ransom this time. Twelve days have gone by since I returned from my hard life abroad to Ilion, but now sinister fate has put me in your hands a second time. In hate, somehow, Zeus guided me to you, a man of short life. So my mother bore me, Leothui, daughter of old Altes, lord of the fighting Lelogies, who holds the rock of Pedasus upon the Satnius. Priam, lover of many, loved his daughter, and two of us were born of her. Both men you will have slaughtered. Ay, you killed my brother, amid foot soldiers, noble Polydorus, brought him down with a spear throw. And here my evil hour is come. I see I cannot get away from you. The will of heaven forced us to meet. But think of one thing more, don't kill me, since the belly where I grew never held Hector, 
never held the man who killed your friend, that gentle and strong soldier. In these terms Priam's son pled for his life, but heard a voice of iron say, Young fool, don't talk to me of what you'll barter. In days past, before Patroclus died, I had a mind to spare the Trojans, took them alive in shoals and shipped them out abroad. But now there's not a chance. No man that heaven puts in my hands will get away from death, here before Ilion, least of all a son of Priam. Come, friend, face your death, you too. And why are you so piteous about it? Patroclus died, and he was a finer man by far than you. You see, don't you, how large I am and how well made. My father is noble, a goddess bore me. Yet death waits for me, for me as well, in all the power of fate. A morning comes, or evening, or high noon, when someone takes my life away in war, a spear cast or an arrow from a bowstring. At this the young man's knees failed, and his heart. He lost his grip upon the spear and sank down, opening his arms. Achilles drew his sword and thrust between his neck and collarbone, so the two-edged blade went in up to the hilt. Now face down on the ground he lay stretched out, as dark blood flowed from him, soaking the earth. Achilles picked him up by one foot, wheeled and slung him in the river to be swept off downstream. Then he exulted, Nose down there with fishes. In cold blood they'll kiss your wound and nip your blood away. Your mother cannot put you on your bed to mourn you, but Scamander whirling down will bear you to the sea's broad lap, where any fish that jumps, breaking a wave, may dart under the dark, wind-shivered water to nibble white fat of Lycaon. Trojans, perish in this rout until you reach, and I behind you slaughtering reach the town. The god-begotten river, swiftly flowing, will not save you. Many a bull you've offered, many a trim-hooved horse thrown in alive to Xanthus's whirlpools. All the same, you'll die in blood until I have avenged Patroclus, paid you back for the death wounds of Achaeans, cut down near the deep-sea-going ships far from my eyes. On hearing this, the river darkened to the heart with rage. He cast about for ways to halt prodigious Achilles' feats of war and keep death from the Trojans. Meanwhile, the son of Peleus took his spear and bounded straight ahead for Asteropaeus, burning to kill this son of Pelagon, whom the broad river Axius had fathered on Perabea, eldest of the daughters of Acasamenus. Whirling, deep-running river that he was, Axius loved her. And now Achilles made for Asteropaeus, who came up from the stream bed to confront him, holding two spears. And Xanthus, in his anger over all the young men dead, cut down by Achilles pitilessly in the stream, gave heart to this contender. As they drew near, the great runner and prince was first to speak. Who are you, soldier? Where do you come from, daring to challenge me? Grief comes to all whose sons meet my anger. Pelagon's brave son replied, Heroic son of Peleus, why do you ask my birth? I am a native of rich farmland, Peonia. Peonies are the spearmen I command. Today the eleventh dawn came up since I arrived at Ilion. My line began, if you must know, with Axius, mover of beautiful water over land, who fathered the great spearman Pelagon, and Pelagon is said to have fathered me. But now again to battle, Lord Achilles. This was his prideful answer. Then Achilles lifted his Pelian ash. His enemy, being ambidextrous, cast both spears at once and failed. With one he hit Achilles' shield but could not pierce it, for the gold plate held, the god's gift. With his other spear he grazed the hero's right forearm. Dark blood ran out, but craving man-flesh still, the spear passed on and fixed itself in earth. In turn, Achilles, putting his heart into the cast to bring down Asteropaeus, rifled his ashwood spear. He missed him, hitting the high bank of the river, where the long shaft punched in to half its length. The son of Peleus, drawing sword from hip, lunged forward on his enemy, who could not, with his big fist, work the spear loose. Three times he tried to wrench it from the arching bank, three times relaxed his grip, then put his weight into a fourth attempt to break the shaft, and bent it. But Achilles closed, and killed him with a sword stroke. Near the navel he slashed his belly, all his bowels dropped out, uncoiling to the ground. He gasped, and darkness veiled his eyes. Upon his chest Achilles mounted, and then bent to strip his armour, gloating, This way you'll rest. It is rough work to match yourself with children of Lord Zeus, rivers offspring though you are. 
You claim descent from a broad river, while well, I claim descent from Zeus Almighty. My begetter, lord over many Myrmidons, was Peleus, the son of Iacus, a son of Zeus. Zeus being stronger than the seaward rivers, so are his offspring than a river's get. Here's a big river for you flowing by, if he had power to help you. There's no fighting Zeus, the son of Kronos. Achilloeus cannot rival him, neither can the might of the deep ocean stream, from whom all rivers take their waters, and all branching seas, all springs and deep-sunk wells. And yet he too is terrified by the lightning flash of Zeus and thunder when it crashes out of heaven. With this, he pulled from the bank's overhang his bronze-shod spear, and having torn the life out of the body, left it there to lie in sand where the dark water lapped at it. Then eels and fish attended to the body, picking and nibbling kidney fat away. As for Achilles, he ran onward, chasing spearmen of Peonia in their route along the eddying river. These had seen their hero vanquished by the hand and blade and power of Achilles. Now he slew Thersilochus, Maiden and Astypalus, Nisus, Thracius, Aeneas, Ophelistes, and would have killed far more had not the river, cold with rage, in likeness of a man, assumed a voice, and spoken from a whirlpool. O oh, Achilles, you are first in power of all men, first in waywardness as well, as gods forever take your side. If Zeus has given you all Trojans to destroy, destroy them elsewhere, do your execution out on the plain. Now my blue water course is back up, filled with dead. I cannot spend my current in the salt immortal sea being damned with corpses, yet you go on killing wantonly. Let be, marshal of soldiers. Achilles, the great runner, answered, Aye, Scamander, child of Zeus, as you require, the thing shall be. But as for killing Trojans, arrogant enemies, I take no rest until I back them on the town and try out Hector, whether he gets the best of me or I of him. At this he hurled himself upon the Trojans like a wild god. The deep and swirling river then addressed Apollo. All wrong, bow of silver, child of Zeus, you have not worked the will of Zeus. How often he made you free to take the Trojan side. You could defend them until sunset comes, till evening darkens grainland. As he spoke, the great spearman Achilles in a flash leapt into midstream from the arching bank. But he, the river, surged upon the man with all his currents in a roaring flood, and swept up many of the dead who jostled in him killed by Achilles. He ejected these to landward, bellowing like a bull. But living men he kept in his blue streams to hide them in deep places in backwaters. Then round Achilles with an ominous roar a wave mounted. It fell against his shield and staggered him so that he lost his footing. Throwing his arms around a leafy elm he clung to it. It gave way, roots and all, and tore the bank away, and dipped its branches in the clear currents, damming up the river when all had fallen in. The man broke free of swirling water, turned into the plain, and ran like wind in fear. But the great god would not be shaken off. With his dark crest, he reared behind to put the prince Achilles out of action and protect the Trojans. Achilles led him by a spear throw, running as fast as the black eagle called the hunter, strongest and swiftest of all birds. Like him, he flashed ahead, and on his ribs the bronze rang out with a fierce clang. At a wide angle he fled, and the river with tremendous din flowed on behind. Remember how a farmer opens a ditch from a dark reservoir to water plants or garden. With his mattock he clears away the clods that dam the stream, and as the water runs ahead smooth pebbles roll before it. With a purling sound it snakes along the channel, going downhill, outrunning him who leads it. So the wave sent by the river overtook Achilles momently, in spite of his great speed, as gods are stronger than men are. Each time the great battlefield runner, Prince Achilles, turned to make a stand, to learn if all the immortal gods who own the sweep of heaven chased him. Every time the rain-fed river's crest buffeted his back, and cursing he leapt high in the air. Across his knees the pressure of swift water tired him, and sand was washed away under his feet. Lifting his eyes to heaven, Achilles cried, Father Zeus, to think that in my travail not one god would save me from the river, only that. Then I could take the worst. None of the gods in heaven is so to blame as my own mother, who beguiled me, lying, saying my end would come beneath Troy's wall from flashing arrows of Apollo. Oh, I wish Hector had killed me, he's their best. Then one brave man would have brought down another. 
No, I was fated to ignoble death, whelmed in a river like a swineherd's boy, caught by a winter torrent as he crosses. Now as he spoke, Poseidon and Athena, taking human form, moved near and stood, and took his hands to tell him what would calm him. Poseidon was the speaker. Son of Peleus, do not be shaken over much or fearful, seeing what gods we are, your two allies, by favor of Zeus, myself and Pallas Athena. The river is not destined to pull you down. He will fall back, and you will soon perceive it. Meanwhile, here's good counsel if you'll take it. Do not allow your hands to rest from war, from war that treats all men without distinction, till you have rolled the Trojan army back to Ilion, every man of them who runs and shut them in the wall. Then, when you've taken Hector's life, retire upon the ships. We give you glory. It is yours to win. At this, the two went off to join the gods. Achilles, as their great directive stirred him, crossed the plain, filled with flood water now, where beautiful gear of slain men was afloat, and corpses too. With high and plunging strides, he made his way in a great rush against the current, and the broad flooded river could not check him, fired as he was with power by Athena. Scamander, though, did not give up. His rage redoubled, and he reared his foaming crest with a hoarse shout to Simois. My own brother, if we both try, can we not hold this man? If not, he'll storm Lord Priam's tower soon. The Trojans, all in tumult, won't resist him. Give me a hand now. Fill your channels up with water from the springs. Make dry beds brim and lift a wall of water. Let it grind and thump with logs and stones. We'll halt this madman, powerful at the moment though he is, with his intent to match the gods. I say neither his great brawn nor his splendid form will pull him through, nor those magnificent arms. They will be sunk in mud under flood water. As for the man, I'll roll him up in sand and mound a ton of gravel round about him. Achaeans who would gather up his bones will have no notion how, in all the slime I'll pack him in, and that will be his tomb. No need for them to heap a barrow for him when soldiers make his funeral. Now Xanthus surged in turbulence upon Achilles, tossing his crest, roaring with spume and blood and corpses rolling, and a dark wave towering out of the river, fed by heaven, swept downward to overwhelm the son of Peleus. Hera cried aloud in dread for him, whom the great raging stream might wash away, and called to her dear son Hephaestus, Action, game legs, my own child! We thought you'd be a match for whirling Xanthus in the battle. Lend a hand and quickly! Make your fire blaze up. I'll be raising from the sea a rough gale of the west wind and the south wind, able to carry flames to burn the heads and armor off the Trojans. Kindle trees by Xanthus' banks, hurl fire at the river, and do not let him put you off with threats or honeyed speech. No slackening your fury. Only when I call out with a long cry withhold your living fire then. Hephaestus brought heaven's flame to bear. Upon the plain it broke out first, consuming many dead men there from the number whom Achilles killed, while all the plain was burned off and the shining water stopped. As north wind in late summer quickly dries an orchard freshly watered to the pleasure of the gardener, just so the whole reach of the plain grew dry as fire burned the corpses. Then against the river Hephaestus turned his bright flame, and the elms and tamarisks and willows burned away with all the clover, gallingale and rushes plentiful along the winding streams. Then eels and fish in backwaters, in currents, wriggled here and there at the scalding breath of torrid blasts from the great smith Hephaestus, and dried away by them the river cried, Hephaestus, not one god can vie with you, neither would I contend with one so fiery. Break off the quarrel, let the prince Achilles drive the Trojans from their town. Am I a party to that strife? Am I their saviour? He spoke in steam and his clear current seethed the way a cauldron whipped by a white-hot fire boils with a well-fed hog's abundant fat that spatters all the rim as dry split wood turns ash beneath it. So his currents, fanned by fire, seethed, and the river would not flow but came to a halt, tormented by the gale of fire from the heavenly smith Hephaestus. Turning in prayer to Hera, Xanthus said, Hera, why did your son pick out my stream from others to attack? You know I merit this less than the other gods who intervened for Trojans. Yet by heaven, if you command it, I'll give up the fight. 
Let the man too give up, and in the bargain I swear never to interpose between the Trojans and their day of wrath, that day when all Troy blazes with consuming fire, kindled by the warriors of Achaea. Hera, whose arms are white as ivory, listened to this, then told her son Hephaestus, Hold now, splendid child. It will not do to vex an immortal river for men. At this Hephaestus quenched his heavenly fire, and back in its blue channels ran the wave. And now that Xanthus had been overcome, the two gods dropped their combat. Hera, still angry, checked them. Heavy and harsh strife, however, came upon the rest, whose hearts grew stormy on both sides against each other. Now they attacked in uproar. The broad earth resounded, and great heaven blared around them. And Zeus, who heard from his Olympian seat, laughed in his heart for joy, seeing the gods about to meet in strife. And not for long were they apart. Now Ares the shield-cleaver led them. First he lunged against Athena, gripping his bronze-shod spear and roaring at her. Why do you drive the gods to quarrel once more, dogfly, with your bold and stormy ways, and the violent heart that sets you on? Remember telling Diomedes to hit me hard. Remember you yourself, taking the spear quite openly, made a thrust at me, and gashed my noble flesh. Now in your turn for that and all you've done, I think you'll have to pay. With this he struck hard at the storm-cloud shield that trails the rain of heaven. Even a bolt from Zeus will not undo it. Blood-encrusted Ares hit it with his giant spear. Recoiling in her great hand, she picked up a boulder lying there, black, jagged, massive, left by the men of old as a boundary stone, and hurling it hit Ares' neck. His knees gave way, and down he went on seven hundred feet of earth, his long mane in the dust, and armor clanged upon him. Laughing at him, Athena made her vaunt above him. Fool, you've never learned how far superior I'm glad to say I am. Stand up to me. Lie there. You might fulfill your mother's curse, baleful as she is, incensed at you, because you switched to Trojans from Achaeans. Now Aphrodite, Zeus's daughter, taking Ares' hand, began to help him away as he wheezed hard and fought to get his breath. But Hera saw her. She called out to Athena, Daughter of Zeus the Storm King, what a couple! There that dogfly goes, escorting Ares, bane of mankind, out of the deadly war, amid the battle din. Go after them. Athena followed, in a flash, with joy, and from the side struck Aphrodite's breast with doubled fist, so that her knees went slack, her heart faint, and together she and Ares lay in a swoon upon the earth. Athena said derisively, if only all the gods who would assist the Trojans came to fight the Argives with such power. If only they were bold as these, and tough as Aphrodite was, rescuing Ares under my nose. In that case, long ago we should have dropped the war, for long ago we should have carried Ilion by storm. At this Queen Hera smiled, and the Earthshaker said to Apollo, Phoebus, must we too stay out of it? That isn't as it should be when others enter into action. More's the pity if we go back without fighting to Olympus, to the bronze door sill of Zeus. You take the lead, you are younger. It would be awkward of me since I was born before you, no more than you do. Idiot, but how forgetful you have been. Don't you remember, even now, what troubles over Ilion we alone among the gods have had, when from the side of Zeus we came to serve the strong man Laomedon all one year for a stated wage? Then he assigned our work, no trifle for my own. I walled the city massively in well-cut stone to make the place impregnable. You herded cattle slow and dark amid the upland vales of Ida's wooded ridges. When the seasons happily brought to an end our term of hire, barbaric Laomedon kept all wages from us and forced us out with vile threats. To bind us hand and foot, he said, and send us in a slave ship to islands overseas, but first to crop our ears with a bronze knife. So we departed, burning inwardly for payment he had promised and not made. For this you coddle his people now. You are not willing, like the rest of us, to see the Trojans in their pride with wives and children come utterly to ruin and to grief. The lord of distant archery, Apollo, answered, Lord of earthquake, sound of mind, you could not call me if I strove with you for the sake of mortals, poor things that they are. Ephemeral as the flame-like budding leaves, men flourish on the ripe wheat of the grainland. Then in spiritless age they waste and die. We should give up our fighting over men. 
Let men themselves contend with one another. On this he turned away. He would not face his father's brother hand to hand. And now he was derided by his sister, Lady Artemis, huntress of wild beasts, who had her stinging word. In full retreat are you, yielding victory to Poseidon, making him pay nothing for his glory. Idiot. Why do you have your useless bow? I'll never let you brag again in Father's Hall among the gods that you'll oppose Poseidon in the battle. To this, Archer Apollo made no answer. But Hera, Zeus's consort, did, in anger. How can you think to face me, shameless bitch? A hard enemy I'll be for you, although you carry a bow, and Zeus has made of you a lioness to women. You have leave to put to death any you choose. No matter. Better to rend wild beasts on mountainsides and woodland deer than fight a stronger goddess. If you want lessons in war, then you can learn how I excel you, though you face me. Here she took hold of the wrists of Artemis in her left hand. With her right hand she snatched her quiver and bow and boxed her ears with them, smiling to see her duck her head as arrows showered from the quiver. Artemis ran off in tears as a wild dove attacked by a diving hawk will fly to a hollow rock, a narrow cleft where she cannot be taken. So, weeping, she took flight and left her bow. Then Hermes, the wayfinder, said to Leto, I would not dream of fighting you, so rough seen the cloudmaster's wives in fisticuffs. No, you may make your boast quite happily to all the immortal gods that you have beaten me. Leto retrieved the bow of Artemis and picked her arrows up where they had veered and landed in a flurrying of dust. Then she retired with her daughter's weapons. Artemis reached Olympus, crossed the bronze door sill of Zeus, and at her father's knees sank down a weeping girl, her fragrant gown in tremors on her breast. Her father hugged her, asking with a mild laugh, Who in heaven injured you, dear child? Pure willfulness, as though for a naughty act. To this the mistress of baying packs, her hair tied back, replied, Your lady Hera buffeted me, father, she of the snow-white arms, by whom the gods are plagued with strife and bickering. While these two conversed, Phoebus Apollo entered Ilion, concerned for the wall, to keep the Danaean men from storming it this day before their time. The other deathless ones went to Olympus, some in anger, others enjoying triumph, and took their chairs beside their father, lord of Stormcloud. But Achilles, all that time, wrought havoc with the Trojans and their horses. As a smoke column from a burning town goes heavenward, propelled by the gods' anger, grief to many a townsman, toil for all, Achilles brought the Trojans harrowing grief. Erect on Troy's great tower, aging Priam gazed at huge Achilles, before whom Trojans in tumult fled, and no defence materialised. Then, groaning from the tower, Priam descended, for the gatekeepers, known as brave soldiers, he had urgent words. Keep the gates open. Hold them till the troops retiring from battle are in the town. There is Achilles harrying them. Too near. I fear we'll have a slaughter. When our soldiers crowd inside the wall to get their breath, close both your timbered gates, bolt them again. I fear this murderous man may leap the wall. At this they pushed the bolts, opening the gates, and the gateway made a refuge. Then Apollo flashed out to avert death from the Trojans, headed as they were for the high wall, men grown hoarse in thirst, covered with dust out of the plain where they had run. Achilles, wrought to a frenzy, pressed them with his spear, all his great heart bent on winning glory. Troy of the high gates might have fallen now to the Achaean soldiers, but Apollo stirred the prince Agenor, strong and noble son of Antino. Into this man's heart, the god sent courage and stood near him, leaning on an oak tree, concealed in heavy mist, to guard him from the shapes and weight of death. Agenor halted when he saw the raider of cities Achilles, and his heart grew large as he awaited him, saying to himself grimly, This is the end of me. If I break and run before Achilles like the others, he'll take me even so. I'll have my throat cut like a coward for my pains. What if I let them go in panic toward the town ahead of him, while I run at a tangent leaving the wall to cross the plain until I reach the mountain slopes of Ida, taking cover in undergrowth? This evening, after a river bath to cleanse my sweat, I might return to Ilion. Why say it? God forbid he sees me cutting away from Troy into the open. In one sprint he'll have me. After that there's no escape from my last end of death, so powerful the man is, far beyond us all. Suppose I meet him here, on the west approach to Troy. Surely his body, even his, can be wounded by sharp bronze. 
He can live but once. Men say he's mortal, though the son of Kronos, Zeus, awards him glory. Even as he spoke, he pulled himself together to face Achilles, blood surging to his heart before the fight. And as a panther out of underbrush will go to meet a hunter and have no fear, and never falter when it hears the hounds, and even though the hunter draw first blood, the beast trailing the spear that wounded it will not give up until it close with him or else go down, just so the prince Agenor, son of Antenor, would not now retreat until he put Achilles to the test. With round shield held before him, and his spear aimed at the man, he gave a battle shout and cried, You hope today at last to storm the city of the Trojans, a rash hope. Grief and wounds are still to be suffered for her. Inside there we are many fighting men. For our dear parents, wives and sons, we'll hold the city and defend it. You come here to meet your doom, prodigious though you are, sure as you are in warfare. He let fly the sharp spear from his heavy hand and struck the shin below the kneecap square and hard. Around his leg the new shin guard of tin rang out deafeningly. Back from the point of impact sprang the spearhead, piercing nothing, buffeted back by the god's gift. Then Achilles struck in turn at his princely enemy, Agenor, but Apollo would not let him win this glory now. He whisked away Agenor, hid him in mist, and quietly removed him from the war. By trickery, then, he kept the son of Peleus away from Trojan soldiers. Taking Agenor's likeness to the last detail, he halted within range of Achilles, who set off to chase him. For a long time down the plain of Grainland he pursued him, heading him along Scamander, as the god kept a bare lead, for so Apollo teased him on, Achilles thought to catch his quarry with a sprint. Meanwhile the other Trojans in their panic reached the walled town, thanking heaven, and all the city filled up, jammed with men. They dared not wait outside the wall for one another, to learn who died in battle, who came through, but all whose legs had saved them now took cover, in hot haste, entering the city.